of all, a very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Rather, it's uh, tending towards evening time. Uh, it is time for us to now uh, get to our final panel discussion. Well, what an engaging conference this has turned out to be. And it is now time for a rather very engaging panel discussion, which will be talking about implementing a preventive approach to combat mental health concerns, workplace and beyond. While measuring progress on workplace mental health, its promotion and measures, what can the corporates do to create a safe environment for people with mental illness? And how can we make India Inc. more inclusive for people with mental illness? Well, ladies and gentlemen, for this exciting topic and your in, it is time for us to now call upon the screen, our esteemed panelists. First up, Dr. K. Madan Gopal, Senior Consultant Health, Niti Ayo, Dr. Brigadier Rakesh Gupta Ji, Director of Government Institute of Medical Sciences, UP. Piyani Das Gupta, Senior Vice President, Marketing, Columbia Pacific Communities. And the session chair is Ruhel Amin, Senior Editor, BW Business World, Executive Editor, BW Applause. Well, with this, I'd like to heartily welcome all our esteemed panelists. Thank you so much for your valuable time. With this, Ruhel, the screen is all yours. Thank you, Bhavna. Thank you for this introduction. Am I audible to all my panelists? Yes. All right. Okay. So I think uh, we don't have need to emphasize more on the importance of uh, mental health given the last two and a half years, a lot of focus has been on it. And rightly so, I think it concerns all of us. And it's the right time that we uh, put it at the center stage and start talking about how we are addressing it, what needs to be done, uh, how can we make it you know, even more effective? Uh, so, so we have a great panel as introduced by Bhavna. I want to start with you, Piali, uh, Piali uh, with you. Uh, 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 my first question to you, uh, Piali, is, uh, you know, in your uh, view, how are organizations, uh, you know, looking at preventive mental health care? Has there been a shift in the way they look at it? Thank you so much, Ruhel, for uh, for the question and a very good evening to everybody that's joined in, uh, as well as to my fellow panelists. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I must uh, mention that, you know, I'm just recovering from COVID and I do have some post-COVID complications. Uh, so I'm coughing excessively. Uh, so do excuse me if I'm if I'm coughing too much, but I'll try to do my best. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. Um, obviously, my professional designation is that I'm Senior Vice President Marketing at Columbia Pacific Communities. That's what I do for a living. But um, in the context of this particular discussion, I'm going to introduce myself as uh, somebody with lived experience. So I am people with lived experience of mental illness. Uh, I was diagnosed with uh, clinical depression and uh, generalized anxiety disorder when I was only 13 years old. And so it's been, um, you know, 24, 25 years of living with this illness uh, and trying to manage it as well as obviously working. And uh, from time to time, uh, I am uh, requested to be part of panels because I also do a lot of advocacy work on mental health. And uh, I have my own podcast as well. And certain publications ask me to write about this particular topic. And I've always said that um, we are, we haven't even, you know, scratched the surface as far as doing something on mental health is concerned. Uh, we are very, very far behind. And um, I, I, I've always said that, you know, uh, what I find unfortunate is the fact that it took a pandemic for us to take mental health seriously. You know, when it is such an integral part of your overall health and wellness, in fact, it is health, which is why it is called mental health. I do not understand why we've sort of for years and decades together, not paid attention to it, not taken it seriously. And in fact, done a tremendous amount of disservice by stigmatizing against uh, people that have mental health issues. Um, as far as organizations are concerned, and I have been a part of some very large organizations as well, 
Um, I, I have to say that uh, not much is being done. Yes, in the last two years, awareness levels have gone up. Uh, there is no denying it. Yes, I think today HR functions are taking it uh, a lot more seriously. There are conversations happening with the leadership. They would probably do a bunch of surveys, like a pulse survey or a Kerasac, uh, you know, um, survey to figure out, you know, how their employees are doing. Um, they would probably have, uh, um, uh, you know, mental health counselors on board uh, to offer free um, support for for uh, for somebody that's going through something. Um, uh, they would probably certain organizations during the pandemic announced a four day work week only to go back to a five day work week. So we've seen a lot of these kind of things. We've seen organizations say that you know there is going to be yoga uh, 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 and meditation available uh, in the premises etc so yes we have seen a lot of these in initiatives but are they enough or are they being done from the point of view of really really looking at mental health seriously or are they being done from the point of view of hey this is something that is going to increase my productivity and is going to help me get better ROI I think right. that is the conversation that we need to have and I think I'm glad that we have doctors today as part of the panel because I think uh, their point of view on this as well as the point of view of people with lived experience is very very important because uh, you know corporates often do things, whether we like to admit it or not, uh, because there is a certain agenda attached to it, right? I mean, you could do a whole bunch of HR-related mental health activities, but that could be ultimately because you want to, let's say, look at certain business objectives, like, uh, you know, better uh, attrition rates or higher productivity or, uh, you know... Uh, uh, yeah, time, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. At times, just to take mark, but I have a separate question for that. Yeah. Yeah. I have a separate question for that. I'll come to it. Uh, let me go to Dr. Gupta at this stage, you know, Absolutely, yeah. with his uh, initial remarks uh, on implementing a preventive approach. When we talk about it, how far have we come in this conversation, according to you? Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone, all my panelists. And... Uh, uh, me for you for inviting me for this panel. See, this is a very important topic uh, in post uh, pandemic that mental health is part and partial of uh, our health and well being. Uh, it is an integral part of the WHO definition that uh, mental health is a physical, mental, social, and spiritual well being. I think now we are taking post COVID complete definition in mind whenever we are concerned with the uh, mental health. So this is, I think, very, very important thing. And uh, as a whole, we are in the government organization, but for corporate, private, everyone now have to look at uh, the mental health of their uh, HR, their uh, employees. This is not only for their own safety, own security, but as well as also for the productivity and whatever outcome you want to you want to expect from your employees probably mental health is part and partial mental health is uh, you know it's not only that uh, they look happy or a uh, lot of factors are there a lot of risk factors are there which has leading probably post covid it is much much more important so this actually uh, involves their own personal problems there are problems because of covid there are nuclear families, they have to take care of their families as well as their workplace. And if they do not look after equally the workplace, probably they are discriminated, a lot of stigma and their performance is actually deteriorating. So probably this is a very important part uh, on the aspect of uh, all stakeholders in government as well as right. private to take care of this uh, mental health in total. Right. Uh, Dr. Gopal, we are very fortunate to have you with us. You know, you are more qualified when it comes to implementing uh, a preventive approach because, you know, it might need a regulatory push at times, you know, to ensure that it happens. But uh, your initial talks when we talk about, you know, preventive uh, approach to combat uh, mental health concerns, how has it evolved over the years, according to you? 
please unmute. Uh, Thank you, Rohel, uh, and thank you for this opportunity uh, to share my thoughts and views. It, no doubt it's a very big issue, and I will just take uh, the things forward where uh, Dr. Tai has left. It took around 40, 45 years to arrive at a definition of health. At least it's a state of uh, physical, social, and mental well-being, not merely an absence of disease. And for implementing that uh, Think some few parameters were agreed that is health for all by 2000. In that at that time, it was only focused on the health, and an approach was uh, designed that is comprehensive for the, the primary health care approach. Then the goal posts were shifted from this uh, health for to the linear development. That's now we have moved from the health from the disease. It was uh, way back before the formation of WHO for disease. From there we come to the health with the indicator we try to measure. From there we have now, the paradigm is now shifting towards the wellness part. That means if you are well, then you can always enjoy the physical, mental and social well-being. So we are focusing more on the well-being. Apart from that, if you talk about the regulatory things, uh, we have the Indian Lunatic Act to 1912, where it was a involuntary admission and in, uh, the doctors were responsible provide treatment and it is at the discretion of the doctors for uh, providing treatment to the patients then in 82 we are having a national mental health uh, program we started the national health program when in india was signed to the almata declaration and we thought that at that time we should be doing something for mental health there also we have started this mental health program it was more or less centers towards awareness as well as preventing and providing treatment to these people then uh, we had this mental, National Mental Health Act in 1987, where we have tried to see that from the involuntariness, it has become a voluntary. That means the patient family and the patient other person can take care of this. But the rights and other issues were not there. Right of a mental person and the issues were not there. And since uh, 1996, we are implementing the district mental health program, where it is focused on more or less providing treatment through the district health uh, network, providing the psychiatric services at the district hospital. We are having around uh, 700 plus uh, districts in the country and each of the districts would be providing that services which are there. Then it was more or less focused on the preventive strategies for screening of the population as well as providing treatment and management of the patient at that level. Then in 2014, because this was all, all centered around the, the treatment aspect, there were no rights issues. We had a then in 2014, we had that uh, uh, national mental health policy where we talked about the rights. I mean, we have seen the act from the rights lens, right of the mental person in this. And 2017, we had the national mental health uh, act where we have talked about uh, the criminalizing because even though act was there, but the, there were other acts, the other uh, uh, CPR acts were there, which were taking precedence for this mental act. The mental person was not having any uh, right to for the property. He, he was not having even the, the ground for divorce and other things. Uh, if the person is not mentally sane, there, there were certain issues with that. So in that, all the things were addressed during this 2017 Act. And with now, you see what change has come. Previously, for the uh, ECT the therapies, you no consent was required. Now. A consent is required and the anesthesia is required for providing that. We have evolved from that level to this level. And the district mental health program might have seen that there would be many uh, societies uh, which have been formed at the Mohalla level as well as the village level, which are trying to provide some preventive uh, prevent services to these people. So that's one thing. And in the course of discussion, we can discuss and uh, discuss all right. aspects about all this. No, absolutely. So no, absolutely. I think you have given an uh, overview, uh, you know, how things have changed. Uh, and thank you really for that. Purely, you know, as an expert and someone who has lived, you know, who has a lived experience of what all it means that we are discussing, you know, uh, how can, uh, you know, organizations measure progress on, uh, uh, you know, mental health at work? What are the bigger challenges, you know, and what are the right ways to do that? 
Right. Look, I mean, there are there are obviously different ways of measuring whether uh, you know uh, an organization has made progress uh, uh, on mental health or not. Right. Like I mentioned earlier. Uh, to you that there are several tools that there is a model called Karasak, which, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, somebody had uh, uh, sort of uh, um, come up with uh, in, uh, at least about 20, 25 years ago, which a lot of companies do use, you could do a pulse um, a check. Uh, <coughs> there are questionnaires where, you know, you, you kind of talk about whether uh, an organization um, is able to give you decision uh, latitude, is able to uh, guide you with, with the kind of work and not overwhelm you with work and also is able to give you the right kind of support. And on the of this, um, you know, um, it, is, it is decided what kind of scores uh, are given, right? But I think the point here is, like I mentioned earlier as well, what is the objective? What is the objective of doing this? You know, is the objective purely productivity led, uh, business led? Uh, because then I do not know if that is the right approach. Uh, um, on the other hand, if it is really about caring genuinely about uh, uh, the mental health uh, state of people and understanding that mental health is a very, very integral part of physical health and the two go hand in hand. And there is you know, um, uh, there's no physical health without mental health, um, then I think, you know, we're talking about progress, right? Typically, what is being done today is like you yourself rightly said, it's a lot of tick marks, right? I, we have done this, we have done yoga, we have done, uh, we have done counselor, we have done uh, four day work week and all of that, which is all fine. I mean, at least something is being done. But are you primarily and fundamentally encouraging open conversations in your workplace around mental health, giving people a safe and no judgment environment to talk about their struggles, uh, creating platforms actively where these conversations can take place and involving leadership who also show their vulnerability in order to come across somebody, uh, in order to build a culture where vulnerability is uh, is is not only accepted but even celebrated. I think that to me is is the right approach. Uh, I I think that uh, a lot of companies are probably not looking at the bigger picture. They're looking at mental health because today suddenly after two years of COVID, it's a huge talking point, and you can't not talk about mental health, and it's the cool thing to talk about or the in thing to talk about. Uh, I'm glad that people are finally talking about it, but are you are you taking care of the brass tacks and the fundamentals? And the fundamentals here is mental health is a topic that is steeped in, in, in stigma. It is steeped in stigma. Uh, people suffering from mental health issues have always been stigmatized against at work. They've always been seen differently. They've always been, um, let's say, denied certain kinds of responsibilities. They've always been kind of bracketed as let's say difficult or whatever it is right um are you actively doing something as leadership to actually dispel all of that i think that is is really uh, the need of the hour it's not so much about saying that oh on my mental health index i have a mental health index i've moved from seven to nine right that's great but um what are you doing beyond that i think that's really what we need to focus on Thanks, thanks, Piali, for uh, sharing these uh, insights. Uh, Dr. Gupta, you know, I, I have a specific question for you. Uh, you know, mental health has gradually moved to, uh, you know, the, there's, a, there's a difference of, you know, uh, like in the upper class and, you know, all this economically higher classes. You know, it's an issue that can be addressed. But in a state like UP where, you know, and, you know, it... it uh, maybe a taboo in certain places, you know, how do you ensure such conversations are accepted even, you know, people go and treat themselves for mental health. I think it's not still acceptable in a larger part of the India part, of course, understands the Bharat part is still yeah. coming to terms with this thing called mental health. I think there's a lot of taboo. Is it correct? Am I right? And how do you address it? Thank you, sir. I think this is a very pertinent question. And uh, what you said, you know, for middle and a lower class, right, still it is in a taboo. 
for any employee person at a workplace declaring himself not mentally sound or describing or discussing something, probably I think it's a taboo. And just what Madam Bialya said, they are rightly discriminated and uh, they are actually not given the due response to what they are supposed to. So this is actually a role of uh, leaders and then managers to ensure that mental health also should be taken care of at the lowest level. Right. So what we have to have, uh, we have to remove the stigma. It is not easy. It is difficult. We have to improve the communication at all levels, maybe horizontal, vertical, diagonal. There people should be have you know, good accessibility uh, to what uh, Madam has said. There should be a active creative platform where the people can actually express, may not be by name, may not be anonymously. They can launch uh, feedback. Feedback is another way you can get. And anywhere, right, uh, rather than people are coming, uh, the, the higher ups can go to that particular level where they feel that uh, people are not performing well or people. So rather than finding faults with them and then further discriminate, probably they can, uh, you know, find out the effect, what is wrong. And probably there they can find out a lot of uh, feedback. We in our own uh, uh, government institute, we have, you know, do the open darbar. Open darbar, again, people may not come, but at least they know that higher up, uh, the hierarchy is actually sensitive to their issues and probably in one platform or other platform, they normally come out and we try and actually approach them directly or indirectly. So accessibility is one. Taking feedback, uh, good communication uh, we can actually keep. And of course, anybody who needs to be helped, maybe, you know, free uh, sort of a consultation or free checkups, free treatment, all these things, if you made these things available, probably more people will come out, more people will put up their problems. And I think mental health of for the organization can be actually improved. Absolutely, absolutely. Dr. Gopal, uh, are there any regulations being, uh, you know, thought of to mitigate concerns uh, related to mental health at the workplace? Do you think we need a strong regulatory push to implement uh, you know, this? Uh, Rohel, it is very easy to say about regulation. This is the journey which we have made uh, from the Lunatic Act to the uh, National Mental Health Framework, which is there. So you see the progress which we have made because talking about mental issues, uh, talking about regulation as a solution, it's very easy said than done. Because do we have the regulatory capacity? We do have a mental health program. We are in the different uh, level of uh, implementation. Uh, the program is still to mature. It's almost 15, 20 years, and we have to see that a long way to go. The regulation is not going to uh, be that much important because we do have act which uh, mandates that. Previously, you see the whatever problems were there in the 87 Act, they have been rectified after 20, 30, 30 40 years. Uh, we have rectified that thing. It has now given rights. So that kind of thing, but only thing for utilizing this is to empower the person to sense how to use this, enabling provisions which are there in the existing act, existing regulation. They're quite fair enough to at least safeguard the rights and interests of the mental mental health people. But having said this, there are larger more issues uh, about the mental person. You see, it's not the person who reports that hey, I'm not well. And then you see the way the things happen. In the government institution, you see people don't want to go back home. Because if the person is continuing, if they want to work uh, till 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock without any work, if the person is not able to complete his work in the stipulated time, as the as we mature, our attention span also comes down. We require a break from that environment. You see, the mental problem is a large spread. It's not only the person who is coming and reporting. We have to find out ways of helping all these people. It's, regulation is not going to help. We are having enabling provision. I'm just repeating that thing. But it goes way beyond that. You talk about the issues. 
uh, one of the important issues is if the person is doing overtime is he mental that's a question which you have to ask as gupta ji has rightly pointed out whether the administration or the other person they are coming and talking and getting a feedback or not if a person is in a position if he asks a feedback in a policier manner what kind of feedback he will get how many schools they are having counselors it starts from that school level how many of the people we counsel our children and other people we say that kya kiska you take that kind of attitude we are having so lot of work is required it's not the regulation which will bring the uh, kind of change but we have to start work right from our ourselves we start work from ourselves how we treat the other fellow person because the ambition has uh, overtaken all the aspects and the value value system is the ambition as well as making how much money you are making and that drives all the things i start my day on time i finish my day on time but i am more productive than most of the my colleagues they sometimes wonder that ki what is happening so you have to see that ki if the totally strong then he will he will never cling because if they would be if look at the government functionaries and other other if they are trying to cling to the government that, that is office that means something is wrong either with him i home place or something is wrong because a person can't be having an attention span of more right. than 3 hours and so forth we have to address this issues rather than right. it's a it's a as a society we have to address this issue regulation building environment but uh, but uh, given the capacities we can't be forcing people so that's the right. challenge we have to see that how we balance it out and this problem is going to increase with the ambition and the value system more or less coming previously it used to be knowledge now it value system is money only in what by who can grow you have to create money so if that value system is there right from it's not the upper class the lower class also this problem is there because mental health issues they ultimately culminate into the substance abuse the drug abuse everything the addictions and other things also link to the mental issues it's not a simple thing you have to look it in the different gamut and there are many absolutely social dimensions to that we have to address that thing that's absolutely it. absolutely absolutely rahul gopal uh, of course i think it's not just the regulatory push is also you know the awareness part of it and you know people being aware you know unless they do are aware i mean they won't even you know go go for the treatment piali you know two questions for you we have 10 minutes so i have uh, my last set of questions to you first you know one you mentioned you know uh, again i'm coming to that uh, a lived experience you know first tell me how can uh, people with lived experience contribute uh, to the mental health discourse in the country and second there's another taboo you know i might say post partum uh, depression and not many people talk of even that uh, bit so uh, if you could respond to these two questions you know yeah sure uh, ruel um you know before i go on to these questions i just want to add that uh, you know the taboo of mental health is not just something that's in the lower classes i think that's that's not um uh, that that's not uh, the fact in fact i know a lot of extremely educated foreign educated uh, you know established people who are seeing symptoms and are not taking treatment because they do not want the tag of being mentally ill because like dr madan gopal said uh, earlier in the in the conversation uh, mental health was considered being lunatic right i mean the, you heard about the whole uh, the, the journey of you know how from a, from lunatic uh, uh, act it's now become something else and i think that association right and that correlation of mental illness being uh, something to do with being mad or not being okay or being unstable or being uh, a lunatic is something that uh, we still deal with and it's it's very much prevalent even even in uh, upper class uh, uh, society as well as in in middle classes in 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 all classes right coming to the question of uh, <clears throat> how can people with lived experiences that is pwle people like me 
contribute to the overall discourse. Um, a couple of things. One is, I think people with lived experiences should be actively sought out for forums, for discussions, for discourses, for um, you know various um, activations in in mental health and and the the awareness building initiatives of mental health to come and openly talk about their experiences. Now everybody has a certain um, you know, a, a certain level of comfort in talking about it. Today, I can openly talk about my experiences of living with depression and anxiety. Five years back, I was not this person, right? And something in me changed and I decided to become an advocate. Now, not everybody is going to be an advocate and that's fine, but the ones who are ready to talk about it and the ones who actually come out and share their experiences should be sought out in organizations, outside organizations, to come and share their experiences so that people who do not have the illness know exactly what is it like to live with the illness and the symptoms. And more importantly, know that there are there is a difference between the symptoms of the illness and the human being. And often, because the symptoms often you know, engulf the human being, we forget to look at the human being separately from the symptoms of the illness, right? Um, and I think these are these are things that are very important to be understood, particularly in the workplace environment, right? Um, the second thing that I want to say is that, you know, people with lived experiences are a very rich resource of uh, all kinds of information. Now, whether that is information that is needed to do further research, whether that is information needed to do a breakthrough study in mental health. For example, I have contributed a lot of my time towards these kind of researches and things like that. And the idea is to actually tap into that, right? And finally, the third thing that I want to talk about is that, you know, there's a lot of conversation today around diversity, equity, and inclusion. We talk about DEI all the time, it's, it's the other buzzword. Uh, but what is really diversity, equity, and inclusion? You know, diversity, equity, and inclusion can't just be about hiring a woman CEO. It can't just be about hiring 50 Not the gender, people. just the gender conversation. Yeah, it is not just about gender diversity. That is, yes, one kind of diversity for sure. But real diversity, equity, and inclusion is about actively hiring all kinds of people with all kinds of experiences, whether they're mentally ill people, they're up, whether they're people with a physical disability, whether they're people from the LGBTQIA community, uh, whether they're people in the autism spectrum, are you actively hiring people of all kinds, including neurodiverse people, so that your workplace clearly becomes something truly diverse for you to be then able to tap into uh, you know, the resources that you have and build policies that truly make your workplace inclusive. Otherwise, I think we are doing a great disservice to the whole conversation of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that I think is the first part of the question. The second part of the question was about, uh, and I hope that that answers your question. The second part of the question was about postpartum depression. Uh, postpartum depression is depression that affects new mothers after they have had a child. They suddenly slip into depression. I know of many cases, people that I have worked with, uh, people that I continue to work with, people that I have the highest amount of respect for who have gone through this very, very challenging phase. And although I am not a mother myself, but I've gone through and I'm currently continue to go through depression, which is a life alterating debilitating disease, um, which becomes very, very challenging to deal with when you are also having to uh, get to work and get things done and, and, and you know carry out your responsibilities there. We have to understand that 20%, if you look at the data today, 20% of women in India, new mothers in India suffer from postpartum depression. That's one in five new mothers. It's as common as that. And yet there are no conversations around it. There is again, a lot of misconceptions, stigma around it. And you know, the more I think about it, the more I feel that it is because women in our culture have always been seen as, uh, you know, as, as nurturers, and that is supposed to be our default role in, in, in the culture, right? So you cannot somehow, you know, come to terms with this idea of a woman who's become a mother 
being depressed, depressed. right Absolutely. i mean you you sort of you sort of by default thing that somebody who's a mother and has just given birth to a child is by default extremely happy and very content but that's not that's that's just not how brain chemicals work you know i mean it is it is a different phase of life that she's getting into her priorities in life have changed overnight her body is going through all kinds of changes that she herself is not being able to make sense of and she's entering a phase of life which is not really prepared for she has no first hand experience of it right so obviously it's a, it's um, it's an extremely challenging time and therefore postpartum depression is a reality it is something hundreds of women are dealing with quietly silently not able to speak up at work in fact uh, i remember this absolutely brilliant campaign that prega news had done about 3 to 4 years ago on postpartum depression which i think everybody should watch on 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 youtube and um, and it's it's just something that uh, organizations are ill equipped to handle they have no idea how to handle this they have not done anything to understand uh, how to build a support system around new mothers and building a support system around new mothers is not just about giving them a crash and giving right. them maternity leave and giving them off time and things like that it is also about understanding whether they are going through a severe mental illness and how do you then sort of you know support them so i mean those are my uh, points of view on this i hope i, I hope that, that answers your question absolutely i think i think really you have given a very <laughs> elaborate in depth uh, you know uh, view of the the problem uh, my, my last set of question to uh, dr gupta and uh, dr gopal dr gupta to you what changes are needed to uh, ensure that you know preventive mental health care becomes a top priority at all levels uh, first to you dr gupta yeah thank you sir uh, i think uh, if you go to the whole symposium and ultimately this is what actually the take home message is for everyone who is listening and probably this is very important now first and find out so i said um, if you want to improve the mental health of any organization probably you have to understand the facts you have to find out what the work related risk factors which can actually are causing a great uh, mental uh, stress among the employees or the workers so what is re required to be done you have to have a find out the causes it could be a poor communication uh, both horizontal vertical diagonal there is a very poor interaction between among the workers to their managers or seniors in any organization so interaction is important we have to encourage interaction so that they can come out with their problems right then we have to train our people one you can compensate your uh, or you can improve the efficiency of your workers or uh, your employees by empowering them by good training good skills if you teach them you have to look after in case they they are working in a unsafe environment so you have to see the safety of their uh, uh, environment you have to improve their uh, decision making like all the workers they should be empowered if they wanted something to be done something to be modified probably they should be given the liberty to change even our own organizations uh, uh, you know objective also should be clear right it is not only you no know, profit making or your goal achieving you have to see the limitations in which they are working and probably they are doing their best and if you improve their working conditions probably their output will definitely improve then we can uh, promote the mental health by positive aspect of the work we can make the ambience you know good lighting optimal temperature availability of uh, you know their recreational activity uh, their you know uh, availability of um, uh, food good canteen i think these are various incentives then you have to have a active measures to improve the mental health you can have create some platform where people can come and have access you can appoint uh, counselors where actually they can go and interact other than interacting with their superiors probably they are much better accessibility we have to improve in the system so that people should come out you can facilitate you can empower you can have some staff developmental programs where probably they are more encouraged to join and probably you know their income and future prospects also improve so overall right. you have to see and of course then you have to provide them 
free or subsidize your checkups, availability of treatment. So I think if you see in total, probably you can improve their ways and means to find out and their ways right. and means to improve the mental health of the organization. Right. Uh, final words, Dr. Gopal. Uh... Well, thanks. One of the important things at workplace is that we should have a workplace policy for, for dealing with the mental health of the persons. One way is to adopt that uh, ES, ESG framework, which everybody talks about, but uh, very few adopt. We said that how we move towards adopting that ESG framework. We only create stress to the employees. Now we see that how to de-stress them by creating recreational activities and opportunities for them. It's very easy because many of the organizations for the sake of recreation, they create a, a gym, gym, gym facilities there. But gym and other thing, only the persons who are interested in doing this uh, over the gym enthusiastic, they would be going in. The other games also with the uh, people can play and they can relax themselves. You have to create that kind of culture. The hierarchy has to cut uh, cut across all the sections. It should not be that yeah, I'm the boss, you're the worker. They should play all play together. Then only the collective feeling and the comrades will come and the collective uh, growth of the organization can happen. So, a lot of things to be done, but the things have to start at our level. What best we can do to see that the person whom we are interacting uh, at the house level, how you are treating with your uh, the household helps and other person. It has to start from there. So how you treat your uh, this, uh, colleagues and others, we have to start from ourselves and the organization uh, can evolve and mature or, uh, around that thing. I will stop here. Otherwise, a lot of things to be done. It's very easy to talk about uh, mental health, this to be done, this to be done. But we, should, right. we have to nudge the people in changing their behavior. It has to start from us so, so that we Absolutely. can talk and we can take it forward. I will stop Absolutely. Here. Um, I'm really sorry we're out of time, but thank you so much, uh, Piali, Dr. Gupta, and Dr. Rupal, for sharing your insightful thoughts on this discussion. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, esteemed panelists. Thank you for joining us today.